Bwana sifiwe. Thank you for coming to church. Please wave at me like this. Amen. It's great to see you. Our theme for this year has been launch into the deep. And most of our sessions have been in line with this theme. In the first quarter, we handled preparing for the big catch. In the second quarter, we handled God with us, in us, and for us. Today, we will be introducing the third emphasis of our quarter, which is the Christian life, God's way. And in this, we will be going through the book of Acts from chapter 1 through to chapter 28, which is the last chapter of the book of Acts. So that is what I will be introducing today. And so what I'll be doing is simply to give an overview of the whole book of Acts, which is quite a task, Cindy. But we trust that God will grant us grace and we will be able to go through the whole of it and just get to see what happens in the whole book of Acts, what's the main message, pick out a few themes and draw lessons from it. We didn't remember to appreciate our brother Mushemi for leading us so well. Let's appreciate him. Thank you so much. God bless you. Yeah, so today we'll be introducing that. And I'll be taking us through the overview. Uh, I've, I've, I've gone through the text, but I've also referred to other sources. So, so some of my sources include the Bible Project, uh, the African Bible Commentary, NKJIV Study Notes, and the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Those are some of the references I went to. So... Uh, should you feel like I am too bright? No, I also borrowed from the brightness of, of, of others. Let me quote that early. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll be picking from Acts chapter 1. We just want to read a portion of it before we go through the overview. Acts chapter 1, we will read three verses. It's in the previous slide. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to teach. Could we skip to verse 6? They gathered around him. That's Jesus. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up from their very eyes and a loud cloud hid him from their sight. We will build on that as we go through the overview. I pray that you will go along with me. It is very long, but we will try to move together in a pace that will not make you feel bored or left behind. So the book of Acts is a great reference book for Christians and for the church as a whole. You can draw so many lessons by just observing the things that went on among the apostles in the book of Acts. Some of their actions, their convictions, their doctrines, the experiences they went through in life. However, as we make these observations and learn from it, we must be keen to identify and distinguish what is prescriptive from what is descriptive. That simply means that some of the things we will observe may not necessarily be applied directly in our context, since they only describe the context of the early church. Others, on the other hand, are things that we can observe and we should live by or emulate and actually apply word by word according to how it is described in, the, in this book. So some of the things are descriptive and others are prescriptive. So that means some are, are, are normative. We should build a norm out of them. Others are just letting us know how things went on those days. Cindy for example, you remember 
where the, the, the move of the Spirit of God was so real that, that, that even the use of handkerchiefs were used to, to, to bring healing, Cindyo, and, and to minister miracles. Now, is that prescriptive or descriptive? It is descriptive. Yes, so I should not come with handkerchiefs every, on Sunday and say, touch this one. It has been anointed by the man of God himself, isn't it? And say, I'm basing my practice on the book of Acts. No, it is descriptive. Then others are prescriptive, isn't it? They are actually telling us what we need to emulate and pick from that book and the stories or the lessons that we draw from this text. Now, this is the second volume of the unified work of the apostle, sorry, of the writer of the gospel of Luke. So both Acts and Luke were written by Luke, the one who wrote the gospel. Luke was a traveling co-worker to Paul, okay? He was a physician. He's the one who gave an account in the book of Luke, the gospel. This is clear from the book's introduction in which Luke says, I produced my first volume of all the things Jesus began to do and teach. He says that referring to the gospel of Luke. In this opening line, Luke also gives a clue as to what the book of Acts will be about. So Luke presents his work as one presenting two volumes. The first volume is the things that Jesus began to do and teach. Okay? Then the second volume, which is the book of Acts, what do you think now it is? Things that Jesus continued to, to do and to teach, both personally and through the work of the Holy Spirit. So he presents these two books as two volumes. The Gospel of Luke is the first volume and the and Acts is the second volume. Though when you read your Bible, how it is arranged, there is John in between, but Luke came, Acts came immediately after, after Luke, after the gospel of Luke as a continuation of the work of the, of, of the writer of that gospel. So he was a physician, and he gives an account of the things Jesus began to do and teach. He continues to do that in the book of Acts. Now, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. But as you read through it, you will realize that a more accurate name for this book would have actually been the Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. Because the main character in the book of Acts is Jesus Christ. And all through, he is either working directly or through the Holy Spirit. The mission that people are carrying out in the book of Acts is the mission of Jesus let me give us an outline of the book of Acts. Now, there are different outlines, and every theologian comes out, up with their own outline depending on that which they want to achieve. So that people can go home early, we've given it this outline, okay? So that we are able to cover the whole book within one service, okay? Now, this will be a, an outline that combines many blocks in one. It can still be divided further, into subsections. But for today, we will go through Acts chapter 1, which is Jesus commissioning his disciples and the ascents to heaven. Acts chapter 2 to chapter 7 is covering the Pentecost in Jerusalem and the birth of the church. Acts chapter 8 to chapter 12 covers the community of believers and how they became an international movement. Acts chapter 13 to 20 covers the mission to Israel and clashes with the Roman culture. Acts chapter 21 to 28, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem and imprisoned in Rome. Now I'll share these notes with us because I'll be moving very fast. So in case you are writing notes, if you feel like I've left you behind, it's okay. You can just write up to where you can, but I'll share the notes on our church platforms. Now let's begin with the first part of Acts chapter 1, which is the introduction. Here, the kingdom of God is introduced by Jesus himself. Luke starts by recounting how the reason Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. This is highlighted in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. 
connecting back to the story of his gospel in Luke. Jesus presents himself to be restoring the kingdom over the world beginning with Israel. He called Israel to live under God's reign by following him. He presents himself to the disciples after resurrection as the enthroned messianic king, a title and a privilege he acquired when he gave up his life, conquering death through his love. The book of Acts begins with the risen King Jesus instructing the disciples about life in his kingdom. Now, Initially, before we come to the book of Acts, when Jesus taught his disciples, he had a lot of reference to the Father. He would talk and say things like, I only do what I see my Father do. I have come to accomplish the will of my Father. I'm about to accomplish my task on earth so that I can go back to my Father. At this point, Jesus has already accomplished that which the Father sent him to do. And he comes back, not as the same Jesus who left earth when he was killed and, and, and left for dead. He comes back as the King of kings and Lord of lords because he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And having done that, he had received the dominion and the power and he had been enthroned as the King of kings, the one who comes back now to rule and reign over the affairs of God's people. So he is not coming back to point people to the Father. He is coming back to point people to himself. For now, anyone who gets an encounter with him has experienced the Father. Praise the Lord. So the Father has given him power and authority and dominion and he comes with that confidence. Do you remember him sharing with the apostles and telling them, stay in Jerusalem, I will go back to my Father and ask him to send a helper. This time he has come and he is not mentioning a lot about the Father because he went, engaged with the Father, was enthroned as the messianic king and comes back with that power and authority. The power that raised Jesus from the dead was now evidently at work in him. Jesus promises that the Spirit will soon come and fill them in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies made by Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Joel. These are highlighted in Isaiah chapter 32, Ezekiel 36, and Joel chapter 2. The messianic kingdom, signified by the presence of God through his Holy Spirit, will reside in his people and transform their hearts as the new temple. Many of the prophets in the Old Testament had made them look forward to the coming of this Messiah, whose coming would mark the beginning of the last days. And this is when, these are the days when the Holy Spirit would be poured upon all flesh, as prophesied by Joel. Jesus says that when this happens, the Spirit will empower his disciples to be witnesses of him in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is what is highlighted in the portion we read from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. From here, Jesus is taken up from their sight in a cloud. This image is supposed to help them identify with Christ from the perspective of Daniel chapter 7 as showing Jesus now as being enthroned as the son of man who was to vindicate who was to be vindicated after his suffering now you will realize that in the gospel of Luke and Matthew the writers keep going back and forth from the present to the old testament okay this is because they are talking to a jewish audience and to the Jews, they were so in touch with the realities of the Old Testament. Things that were done by their father Abraham, things that were done by Moses, things that were done by the patriarchs and the prophets. And so because they grew up reciting these things, believing in them, living by them, drawing their life convictions from them, whenever anyone touched on something from the Old Testament, it gave them a perspective of the present. They held on to the things they learned from the Old Testament so much to the point that it even became a hindrance to them experiencing the newness of the things God was doing in their age. And so one of the ways of capturing them is by attaching the present happening to the 
things that were prophesied in the Old Testament. That is what the apostles and many people in their teaching endeavored to do. Because in every community and society, there are things that that society considers vital. Things that if you touch on, even if they were not concentrating in your sermon, they now start concentrating, isn't it? Yeah. There are topics, if you say next Sunday we will be handling, for example, which topic? Anyone? Financial breakthrough. Seven secrets to financial breakthrough. The sixth one will shock you. When you say that, there is a way it captures people, isn't it? Because it is ministering directly to a need that they identify with. Or you talk to the point that on next, next, next Sunday I'll be coming to tell you who is the chosen one in Kenya. We know there are many things going on, mandamano and everything. I have a revelation. I'll be coming to tell you who. I've been away in prayer and fasting. Th th that, that captures people. And you can be sure some people will come to church on that day. Why? Because you are touching on an area that interests them. Those are things that form people's identities. There is a way when you try to brush off people's identity, even in a sermon, there is a way they start looking at you. They start feeling, yes, this pastor is preaching well, but he should not forget that he is a young man. We have seen a lot of things. He cannot just come here and start talking like this. Hey, 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 may the elders talk to him, isn't it? Because you've shaken something that rubs on their identity. The Jews clung on their identity from the Old Testament in a big way. For the gospel to be presented to them, it had to be attached to the Old Testament. That's why you see Matthew be laboring to first give them a genealogy before he presents Jesus. Because who you Jesus come, we can't trace him to Abraham Akai. That's how Jews reasoned. Just show us how it moved from Abraham through if Joseph is related to Abraham, we will accept Jesus. If not, these stories of all conceived by the Holy Spirit is in Izenu. And so the writers of the gospel do not overlook those cultural barriers. They try to attach the gospel back to the Old Testament in a manner that presents it as real to a Jewish audience. And so in most of the preaching highlighted in the book of Acts, you will see the back and forth, quoting of prophecies, quoting of Moses, quoting of Abraham, so that this Jewish audience would accept Jesus as the Messiah that was to be sent to Jews for their deliverance. The main themes are designed in this book to flow in the opening chapter. The book of Acts is about Jesus leading his people through the Spirit, to go out into the world and invite nations to live under his reign. This begins with the message in Jerusalem highlighted in chapter 2 to chapter 7. Into the neighboring regions of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this leads us to the second section of our outline which is Acts chapter 2 to chapter 7 the Pentecost in Jerusalem, and the birth of the church. Now, before this time, people didn't identify with the word church. What did people identify with? Temple. So if you wanted to talk to people about a place where people gather and go for fellowship, you mentioned the word temple. Now, that means a lot to the Jewish audience. When you talk about the temple, you get them. Those are the things they didn't want people to talk about casually. Those are the things that really provoked them when Jesus was talking. And you know, Jesus would use the same things to provoke them. You remember Jesus telling them, Hey, temple. Hey, man, are you going to be? You know, they would be, get so agitated and provoked, wondering, Hey, our fathers built this temple. Took all those years. This is where the presence of God dwells. Then you come and say, you are, are you greater than our fathers? Now, whenever that was provoked, Jesus now had a chance to bring the gospel, okay? And share a message that could get them. 
So in chapter 2 to chapter 7, the followers of Jesus wait in the city as instructed by Jesus. The sequence of events in this chapter are deliberate. It begins with the replacement of Judas by Matthias, who was set in that scene before the coming of the Holy Spirit. This was not accidental, because the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to enable the 12 apostles, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, to become witnesses of Jesus, both in Israel and to the world. So before Matthias comes to replace Judas, the disciples are... 11. And so if the Holy Spirit comes to 11 disciples, one nation of Israel is left out. So that's why that is ordered like that. They replace Judas with Matthias and now the Holy Spirit comes and that signifies that the Spirit has come to all the tribes of Israel and it will now be spread from there to the ends of the world. Jews and people from a wide variety of places and ethnic backgrounds had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost comes from the Greek word Pentecoste, which means 50th. This Jewish holiday was also known as Shavuot. It is celebrated on the seventh Sunday after Easter, which is also 50 days after Easter, hence the name. Originally, Pentecost or Shavuot was the 50th day after Sabbath when the Israelites were instructed by Moses in Leviticus chapter 23 and in Deuteronomy chapter 26 to present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. This was the presentation of first fruits to the priests as an act of worship. It was more than just bringing crops before God because it was a time to remember how Israel arrived in the land that they lived in, which was something that they did not take for granted. Just as each one of us can reflect and remember our journeys of faith and our walk with God, it was a time for them to pause and remember. Now, in the Old Testament, one of the key things that Israelis were to do from time to time was to stop, pause, during Shabbat and during festivals like this, and remember the faithfulness of God, how the Lord had brought them from Egypt into their own land, and in that sense, res respond by worshiping and praising him. This meant never forgetting where they had come from in the past in order to continue being thankful in the present. It meant remembering the land, that land was a gift from the Lord and it was an opportunity to rejoice, enjoy, and even celebrate with friends and family. This is the celebration that was going on in Jerusalem at the time when the Holy Spirit was going to come to the apostles. Now, people had not come to Jerusalem to wait on the Holy Spirit. People had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Pentecost. When these people had gathered, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven and different ethnic backgrounds, some were visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, they heard the disciples speaking their own mother tongue. They were hearing people speaking languages that they could understand. Yet they knew that these were not their tribesmen. Some were shocked. Others made fun of them and said they were drunk with wine. At this point, the Holy Spirit had come down. So Peter stands up and raises his voice and addresses the crowd. He cites three Old Testament passages to demonstrate the biblical basis for the events of Pentecost. He identifies with the prophecy of prophet Joel on the last days, saying that the days had come and the Holy Spirit was a sign of that. He addresses his words specifically to Jews by calling Jesus Lord and Christ. Since Lord was the Greek translation reserved for Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, for us, if we read this and we say, this Jesus, he is both Lord and Christ, we say, amen. It means nothing to us, isn't it? For a Jewish audience, when you tell them that, you provoke them. 
you are trying to equate this man who came and embarrassed himself on the cross to our God, the God of Abraham. Do you know Isaac? Jacob and the sons. You are equating this man to, to him. So Peter saying that this Jesus is both Lord and Christ really provokes them. But now because the Holy Spirit has come and they can tell that the boldness with which Peter is speaking is not his own power. Because they knew Peter. These were not people who came from a foreign place to come and minister the gospel to them. They knew he was a fisherman. These disciples are people who walked with Jesus. They know their parents. They know their families. Yet there is something special that has happened to them that causes them to declare the gospel with great boldness. You remember elsewhere in the book of Acts, they describe Peter and the disciples as people who are obviously ignorant and unschooled. Obviously, you know, the, it's the, the painful part in that statement is obviously. You know, it's okay when you are ignorant and you've not gone to school. It's another case when it's obvious. Someone does not need to engage with you in a five-minute conversation because before they realize he's in class too, you know. Now, that is what the disciples were described as. But now, the boldness with which they articulate the happenings of the Old Testament related to the New Testament and bring the gospel shocks these people and they say, no, this is some good research. There is something working behind these people. Either we're melewa or we don't know what it is, but this is not normal. Now, the same power that is at work in the disciples convicts them and makes them to realize their guilt in the execution of Christ. Because Peter is telling them that they crucified the Messiah. They are moved by Peter's passionate eyewitness testimony and his description of the events that surrounded the death and the resurrection that fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies through Jesus Christ. They are so moved. You can imagine people who grew up with Peter and people who knew him, people they dropped out of school with, can look at him and say, Hey, we know Peter. But there is something he has received that makes him different. That power that is at work, that is causing them to preach the gospel, convicts them. And the Bible says their hearts are cut. The gospel comes, people speaking with boldness that cuts the heart. This is not the gospel they were used to listening to from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They are convicted to the point that they ask the question, what shall we do? To which Peter responds, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Peter shares a simple sermon, just explaining why they are not drunk. Yet 3,000 people get saved. The power of the Holy Spirit begins to manifest on earth. These people had never seen anything like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. The disciples performed many signs and wonders. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by them. All the believers were together and had everything in common. If you thought it was a joke, these people were selling their possession and giving to the needy. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord indeed added to their number daily those who are being saved. You can be sure this was going to attract great opposition from the temple leaders. This is because Luke presents this thing as a contrast between two temples. So let's say this is a temple. Waraka Baptist Church is a temple where myself, Reverend Mburu, and let's say today we have Engineer and, and, and Mushemi, we are the ones in charge of the temple. Our work is to pray for people, and they come to receive the presence of God because as we work where the presence of God is, isn't it? So we come and we tell you, thus says the Lord. 
You shall not continue behaving the way you are behaving. And then when you don't know anything, you come and ask us. Because we dwell in the presence of the Lord. That's the work of the priests, the Pharisees, and the people who are working from the temple. Then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes so that the presence of God is not limited to temples made by human hands. It is now dwelling upon everybody. What are you trying to say about our job? We become redundant in the society. So you are preaching, telling people you are a temple, you are a temple, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit that dwelt in the Holy of Holies. People who tried to touch this ark died before they even knew what was happening. Now you want to say that that Holy Spirit is in people. You see why they opposed Jesus? That God came So there is a contrast here between two temples. One is temples made by human hands, guarded by Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The other is the new temple that Christ is building in his people. So God's new temple is where the community of Jesus followers are gathering every day in the temple courts from house to house. This shows how God now dwells in his people and not in temples made by human hands. Inside these identical notices are two stories that Peter and other apostles are doing. For example, the healing in the temple courts, which leads them to be arrested. Of course, they were going to be arrested. This conflict between the temples culminates to the first wave of persecution. So that the first wave of persecution was orchestrated by the temple people. The people who were to give a platform for the gospel to continue to, to be proclaimed. Praise the Lord. Because it shook their identity. The coming of Jesus made the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to realize that they were more religious than godly. It put into broad daylight the contrast between religion and godliness. To date, whenever the Spirit of God dwells among his people, the contrast is set between believers who are godly and believers who are merely religious. So that the Spirit of God plays a significant role in helping people to live godly lives. First Peter tells us his divine power has given us all that we need to live godly lives. You cannot live godly lives without his divine power. Anyone who claims to be a Christian living godly lives without the help and the power of the Holy Spirit is accepting godliness without the power. And that is what Paul calls a form of godliness. It's an example of how godliness looks like, but it is not godliness. True godliness is prompted by the power of the Spirit of God at work in people. It is contrasted to religion. Religion, I was giving an example to the youths. Elder, today you are the one on duty, so we'll use you as an example a lot. So, so, so religion is, let's say our example is Christ, isn't it? So let's use Elder Mushemi as the one we want to conform to. Religion looks something like this. We look at Elder Mushemi and how he sits. So let's, let's, let's use our, our brother here. We, we want you to emulate Elder, Elder Mushemi so that you are like Mushemi, okay? So the first thing you observe is how he sits. Check how he has sat. Okay, sit like that. Okay? So you cross your, your legs, isn't it? Then you realize he holds his Bible at, at an angle, isn't it? You also hold your Bible at... An angle. So religion is a place where you look at Mushemi, you behave. You look at Mushemi, you do. You know, we look at Christ. Yes, Christ is still the focus. He is the one we are looking at. In fact, we say we have fixed our eyes on Jesus. But by coping and imitating in our own wisdom, in our own power, and in our own understanding. That's religion. Godliness, in the other hand, is my brother coming to Mushemi and says, I want to receive that which is in you, that makes you sit the way you sit and behave the way you behave and talk the way you talk. 
And then Mushemi says, it is the power of God in me. Receive it in Jesus' name. Now, he no longer has to check what Mushemi is doing. Why? The same power at work in Mushemi is at work in his life. Those who try to imitate Christ without receiving the power of the Holy Spirit are practicing religion. And whenever the Spirit of God comes to identify his own, to separate the chaff from the main people, this is what happens. We find a section of Christians opposing it. And saying, oh, hizo ni viruza watu wa Pentecostal, hizo tumeachia nganga. Eh. Hizo, hizo, hapa ni Baptist, we don't do that. So it, it creates division in, in the church. We also have to appreciate that those who have presented it, on the other hand, have presented it with a lot of drama. Until people fear the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Because every time you interact with the Holy Spirit, it's toka, toka, tasaka. Fire, you know, and so when, when you mention when you mention the Holy Spirit, people start by being afraid. You want that power to work in Nganga to be at work in Mia Ikai. Me, I'm okay, I'm okay, Sindio. But the power of the Holy Spirit is what causes us to reflect Christ in his image and likeness. Jesus' followers continue to multiply. From chapter 6 to chapter 7. Of course the conflict has come up to the point that persecution has begun. The number has multiplied so big that they need new leaders. The disciples can no longer oversee these people. So they work on mechanisms of finding new leaders. And it is in this context that people like Stephen become leaders. What was Stephen doing? Stephen was an usher. The ministry is so big that the usher has to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And wisdom. That's when food is divided well. How do you divide the food well without bias? Without the help of the spirit of God. The book of Acts is to help us see how the mundane things of this world must be done from a point of the working of the spirit of God in us. Look at how they were keen to ensure that we don't just appoint any usher. We look at you and we say, no, you, you can't preach, go to ushering. No. The ushers, when given an opportunity to preach, Preached, was stoned, and died. So the ushers were not ushering because they cannot preach. It was because no ministry was insignificant. The power of God was at work in them, and the power of God was being made manifest as they serve food. They serve food to Jews, and Jews feel like, hey, mkai na yo chakula enu. Because the gospel they are preaching as they serve. You know, you are being served and being told, Jesus, Jesus, who you crucified, he has become the Messiah. And you will leave the food for you. It is convicting them. You see, by the time Jesus, Stephen is done speaking to them, they are provoked. And they say, this man is speaking against the temple. The power of God was at work in this church from the least people to the greatest, from the young to the oldest, and I mean from the youth to adults in church. No one was comfortable counting their walk with God based on their experience. Said we've walked with the Lord in, for a long time. Young people, during our days, during our days, hey, we served the Lord. Those who are during your days, the Spirit of God has come, has been poured upon all flesh. People must manifest the power of the gospel. It is not out of the experience of during your days. It's the Spirit of God at work in your life today. Stephen gives a long speech showing how Israel have always rejected the messengers of God, including Jesus. The Jerusalem leaders become enraged and murder Stephen. This launches a wave of persecution against Jesus' followers, driving most of them from the city. And this tragedy actually becomes the means by which Jesus, the, the, the people of Jesus are now sent into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Persecution is real, but everything is running as planned. It is the persecution that orchestrated the moving of people now from Jerusalem to other parts of the gospel could not be chained. This moves us to the next section of Acts chapter 8 to chapter 12. This is where the community of believers become an international movement. They are moving to Judea and Samaria. Luke collects a diverse stories, a diverse group of stories to show how most Jewish 
Jerusalem-based community became a multi-ethnic international movement. So he picks three stories to just show us how this gospel is moving from being local to being international. Here, by the Spirit of God, not by the wisdom of men, praise God, they confess things like, we did not come to you with eloquence and well-arranged words. No, we came by a demonstration of power. That is what makes a ministry international. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You may not relate because nowadays all ministries are international. I don't know why the council has not added international to our name. Roraka Baptist Church, International. Elijah Jezebel is coming, international ministries, Dagoreti. You know, after it has gone international, it comes back to Dagoreti. You, you, you know, here, this was a real international ministry orchestrated by the power of God. What is the evidence? We can see this. Philip goes around and preaches. You remember him meeting the Ethiopian eunuch? The gospel has reached Ethiopia. Saul is converted. Saul used to travel and move across the world doing one job. What was it? Persecuting believers. He is the one this gospel has started with. Strikes him so hard. He does not know what has struck him, but he knows there must be a Lord involved. Yes, who are you, Lord? Peter dreams and gets a vision that God does not consider an Jewish people ritually impure or unworthy of joining the family of Jesus. And so this makes them to continue proclaiming the gospel with boldness to the other parts of the world. And this is what culminates the founding of the church in Antioch, the largest, most cosmopolitan city in that part of the Roman Empire. Luke tells us that Barabbas and a Jewish leader from the Jerusalem church went along with Paul to help this church community. During their time, it also became a first large multi-ethnic church in history, as well as being the location at which the followers of Jesus was first called Christians. From this church, the first international missionaries were sent, and the Great Commission became a reality. Who are the first international missionaries? Paul and Barnabas. This leads us to the second last section of the book of Acts, which is, you can show us the outline again, Acts chapter 13 to chapter 20. The mission to Israel and the clashes with the Roman culture. This thing is now attracting international interest so that it is no longer a Jerusalem affair. The international community is now involved. It was, if it was in our age, these people are now not being presented in the, in the East African delegation of presidents. They are going to be presented in UN. You, you get where it's moving to. Their agenda is running globally and it is impacting every part of the society, including the economy. And so people who are despised to be unschooled and ignorant, the power of God is at work in them and they can no longer be overlooked. Paul and various co-workers traveled around the Roman Empire to announce the good news that Jesus is king. The first journey starts in the interior of Asia Minor, located in the modern-day Turkey, and ends with an important meeting of the apostles back in Jerusalem. The second one is a trip through Asia Minor into the ancient Greece. The third trip goes through the same territory, once again concluding with Paul's journey back to Jerusalem. In recounting these stories, Lucas highlighted a number of key themes through repetition. The first one is the continued mission to Israel. So Paul continues to preach to the ends of the world, but remembers that this thing starts with the Jews. So in every city, he starts by visiting the synagogue and share how Jesus is the risen king. Forming a new multi-ethnic people. Many Jewish people come to recognize Jesus as Messiah. Others, however, oppose Paul and sometimes even run him out of that town as a dangerous rebel who is against the Torah and the Jewish tradition. You see the things they are protecting? Paul discovers that there are some Jews 
followers of Jesus in Antioch, claiming that unless non-Jews, non-Jewish people become Jewish by practicing circumcision, Sabbath, and obeying the kosher food laws, they can't be part of the redeemed people of Jesus. They radically disagree and call on to the attention of the council in Jerusalem. Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus, discuss and discern some of these scriptures and from their experience that God's plan was always to include the nations within his covenant, they rule it out and encourage people that everybody, both the non-Jewish Christians and, 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 and the, the Christians who are Jews originally, can now access Christ without practicing their rituals and their cultural norms. This decision was groundbreaking for the history of the movement of Jesus. The Jewish Messiah presents himself as one who is calling everybody, considering them equal. This was against their cultural norms. Hey, are you still with me? Praise the Lord. I want you to see the power of the Holy Spirit breaking cultural norms. How much has the power of the Holy Spirit transformed you and made you think more like a child of God than a Luo? You must start thinking like one who has had an encounter with the Spirit of God because you have a new identity in Christ, an identity you receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You don't open your mouth somewhere and people say, that's a Luo. Christ is now at work in you. Must challenge cultural biases that cause us to turn away from his ways. Praise God. You've come to the knowledge of the truth. How much does the truth bear fruit in your life? There is a clash of cultures between the early Christians and the Greek and Roman world. Luke records multiple clashes in Philippi, Athens, and Ephesus. Paul announces that Jesus, Paul announces Jesus as the revelation of the one true God. This implication affects them in a big way. Because, you know, at that time, if there is something Jews were longing for, was for these Roman people to be taken away so that they will remain free. But now there is someone coming to tell them, don't worry about Romans. Jesus is the king of kings. There is another king other than this one that is imposing taxes on us. May that message encourage Kenyans. Let the hearer understand. These stories show how the multi-ethnic monotheistic Jesus communities didn't fit into cultural boxes familiar to the Romans. The ancient world had simply never seen anything like this among Christian communities. Multiple stories show how Romans are accusing Paul and Christians of rebellion and treason against Caesar. And it's understandable because people could hear Paul correctly as he announced that there was another king in Acts chapter 17 verse 7. They correctly saw the Christian way of life as a challenge to many Roman cultural values. But every time Paul is arrested and interrogated by the Roman officials, they can't see any threat and they end up releasing him. This is because the gospel was not presented through activism. Praise the Lord. And this should be preached to believers. We are not merely activists. No. We bear the power of God that can influence the mind of the president. There is a way you present yourself to the society when the power of God is at work in you. There is what causes you to be hopeless when economic situations are tough and what you overlook when the power of God is in you. This thing, people are going through difficult economic times. The power of God made the difference. It must make the difference today for believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, living in hopelessness because taxes were raised, housing levy and everything is denying the power of God. Not that we overlook and say, no, they don't matter. But there is another king who reigns. The president may be the king, but there is a king of kings. All these themes show the paradox that the early church presented to the world. 
It was a Jewish messianic movement made up of ethnically diverse communities, men and women, rich and poor, slave and free, well equipped and not. They were all treated as equals because of their allegiance to the King Jesus. So that no one would come to separate them in the name of hustlers and bourgeoisies. This spirit of God unified them. You are not a hustler. You can't identify with a hustler. You deny the power of God. Separating people, making others look like them versus us. Things that believers must live above in these last days. The spirit of God has been poured upon all flesh. Receive the spirit of God and live above cultural, ethnic, and Kenyan norms. Don't reason like an ordinary Kenyan. You are a child of God filled by the spirit of God. The only crime these people can be accused of was not conforming to status quo. Finally, in Acts chapter 21 to chapter 28, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem and imprisoned in Rome. His final missionary journey ends in Jerusalem, where his controversial reputation precedes him. Paul is attacked by Jewish people who think that he has betrayed Israel, attracting the attention of the Roman soldiers. These soldiers, in turn, think that Paul is a terrorist from Egypt who is starting a rebel rebellion so that they arrest him. Paul is put on trial before the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. In chapter 23, we continue seeing Paul being pushed from one leader to the other because of his convictions and stand on account of the power of God at work in him. Governor Felix puts Paul off, hands him over to the next governor. We need such people in our country. Where well, the sitting president said, hey, in my term, this church didn't give me peace. I can't handle them. Hand over to the next president. And you warm up. That one also, you don't give peace. Why? Because the power of God reigns in you. Praise the Lord. Paul ends up in prison for years. Even though each trial fails to declare him guilty. All he's doing is announcing that his hope is in the resurrection that Jesus fulfilled. It's hardly a crime, but at this point, the Roman legal machine can't just let him go. So Paul appeals to the highest court in the land. This, this gospel needed to be preached by a lawyer who knows legal terms. He knows that he can appeal. So this time he appeals to the highest court so that before they... No, no, no ordinary man can sit in that bench. It's the chief justice who must come. It will take her time. They will go through this thing and they can clearly tell they are not winning. And the lawyer has his facts. God is using people's skills and professional gifts to advance the gospel. May lawyers stand out for Christ in our generation. The spirit of God still fills lawyers. And gives them a new identity. Amen. And so he's transferred as a prisoner to Rome. He appeals. And this time he wins. He says, it's okay. You must imprison me because we are under the Roman rule. But on one condition. It is house imprisonment. So don't put me under the bars. And so Paul ensures that he gives his terms also. Says, I'll be imprisoned, yes, but under these terms. Do you think the Christian community in Kenya can come together looking away from their religious inclinations and things like that and just become a force that the government can reckon with? And give terms so that when the church speaks, people listen to them attentively. Praise God. They don't speak in their own ethnic languages, yet they claim to be the church. So that the church in Nyanza agrees with Raela, the church in Rift Valley agrees with Ruto. The power of God is demonstrated when the Lord defies those cultural barriers. And people speak with one voice as enabled by the power of God. Amen. It makes the whole difference. 
And it changes the narrative and the nonsense we observe every time churches meet together in the name of interdenominational meetings. That must be preached in church. Or else we will be hypocrites having a form of godliness but denying the power of God that leads to transformation. The book ends with Paul announcing the kingdom of God and boldly teaching about Jesus through as the Messiah. Totally unhindered. He is now in, uh, under house arrest. He ensures that the house he lives in, he pays rent by himself. Now you see why the other churches were supporting him? Why people were sending support to him? And this becomes the point where he, the point from which he writes the epistles. So though they may arrest him and confine him in one house, he has access to people. Akina Timothy, Philemon, Titus, people are coming to visit him. He is giving them letters. The gospel is advancing to date. The gospel cannot be chained. It is the power of God unto salvation. Do not be ashamed of it. And so the gospel advice advances right under Caesar's nose in Rome. In Acts chapter 31. They try to chain him. They chain Paul. We don't hear of Paul again after Acts chapter 28 verse 31. But the gospel we preach to date. It is the power of God. This is our conclusion. That the unified work of Luke and Acts do so much more than just giving us a history of Jesus and the early church. They tell the story of how God's kingdom arrived here on earth as in heaven. It began with Jesus' life death and resurrection and it continued through the coming of the Holy Spirit to empower Jesus' followers to bear witnesses, witness for Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. In telling this story, Luke has also given us course of examples of what faithfulness to the King Jesus looks like. It means, number one, sharing the good news of the risen King through words and actions. Praise the Lord. True godliness is where our words are accompanied by action. Praise the Lord. What prompts us to act in response to God's word is the spirit of God. A believer filled with the Holy Spirit moves beyond words written in the Bible to live them and act them in their daily lives. This results to the formation of a diverse community in which people of all kinds are treated equally as they give their allegiance to Jesus and live by his teachings. And the threading of all this together is the power and guidance offered by the Holy Spirit who leads the church beyond chapter 28 and continues the story even today. Praise the Lord. This is your story. The story continues, started with Christ, continued with the apostles, continues to date in this church. Which church? You and me. Every time, don't join the people who say, the church is silent. The church is not saying anything. You are the church. Play your part. Praise the Lord. Start it in your small social influence in your family. May your identity be in Christ. Live out the gospel in word and in deed. Do not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Allow him to fill you and cause you to experience the fullness of God's power. Manifest that in these hard economic times, you will experience the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. You will experience the joy of salvation that gives Christians hope even in difficult times. You will experience what Pete, Stephen experienced when he is being stoned and left for dead, but he's saying, I see the glory of God keeps you going. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. The salvation of mankind. First from the oppression of Satan and all his agents. Then from the oppression by the rulers of this world who are oppressing God's people even in the days of Paul and the disciples. They oppress us to date. It's the power of the gospel that gives us a reason to continue living. Christ is our reason for living. In him we must live and move and have our being. And not be apologetic about it. Just do it not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. 
May he fill you. Why don't we just stand and ask him to fill us as we invite the worship team and conclude the service? That he may fill us, that we may leave church a people empowered of God to live for him, to honor him, to praise him, to advance his kingdom agenda in our generation.